um, we, uh, we took a break to do uh, a sermon series titled Post-Pandemic Me, and uh, Jono and Stephen did an absolutely incredible job uh, just preaching faithfully through God's Word um, and asking the question, how are you doing uh, in light of the pandemic? Uh, the COVID disrupted, it didn't just interrupt our lives, but it disrupted our lives and has changed the way that we do things. Uh, and so the question is, how, how are you doing? Uh, and then how are you doing in light of your relationship with God? And they would always bring it back to Jesus. And so I, I got the privilege of just listening to those messages and was deeply encouraged uh, by them. Uh, but this Sunday, we're back in the book of Hebrews. And I'm actually going to try to tie uh, the previous sermon series to the book of Hebrews because uh, the writer of Hebrews answers uh, a lot of questions I believe many of us are asking uh, which is, w w what do we do now in this, this new world, if you will, this new normal, um, and things are moving at 200 kilometers per hour. It feels like the world is on our shoulders, uh, the uncertainty that lies ahead. So wh wh what are we to do? And so I believe the writer of Hebrews answers that for us in uh, the first part of this chapter. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read uh, our passage for today, and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you, ask that you pray for me, that God would do uh, that which only he can do, and that is save many, uh, and then we'll get into the text, all right? So Hebrews uh, chapter 4, uh, hear these words of our Father. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed, enter the rest in keeping with what he has said. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. For some way he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Again, in that passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter because of disobedience, he again specifies a certain day, today. He specified this speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. These words are old and ancient, but they are not dead. They are very much alive. And so God, I ask uh, that we would see you for who you are through your word. Lord, I pray for every single person here this morning that you would meet them where they are, that you would soften their hearts, that you would make it plain to them what it is that they need. And Holy Spirit, the answer is Jesus. Lead them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Lord, I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, you come to give life and life to the full. And so it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body Think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king, you are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, entering God's rest should be a priority for God's children. Entering God's rest should be a priority for us as a church. Jesus says this in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And let's be honest, we are weary and we are burdened. And I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Entering God's rest is a priority for God's children. In our passage today, there's two words that are repeated over and over again. Those two words are enter and rest. 
But, but what is this rest? If we're going to talk about entering God's rest, what, what is this rest of God? Well, let me give you three quick things. Firstly, to understand what God's rest is, we must look at what came before Hebrews chapter 4. Early Jewish Christians, the audience that the writer of Hebrews is writing to, they were being tempted to engage in the Old Testament rituals once again. They were, they were being tempted to go back to the old ways. God offered them a relationship through Christ. Not, not a ritualistic religious compliance to him. No, no, no. A real relationship. In Hebrews chapter 3, these folks were invited to come into the rest of God. So at the, the very least, this tells us that God's rest is, is not depending on the old covenant, but depending on the new. A new way of living through relationship. Secondly, to define God's rest, we must look at what comes in Hebrews chapter 4, and that's where we're going to be this morning. The author will point us to the disobedient Israelites of the Exodus, the seventh day of creation, the promised land after Joshua's conquest, and the Sabbath system that was instituted by God. So another facet to enter God's rest is found in these, and we will look at them carefully this morning. And then thirdly, and finally, to define God's rest, we must look at what comes after Hebrews chapter 4. I'm hoping you see that I believe the Bible interprets the Bible. So, so if we're trying to understand what something means, then, then let's just go to the Bible. The Bible explains itself. And so, so, so God's rest can be seen by what happens after Hebrews chapter 4, the author will conclude this book with a, a crescendo of phrases to describe the new life that is to come. He, he writes of the city that has, has foundations, these beautiful foundations. It's our homeland. It's our heavenly country. He talks of a city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. He says it's, it's the kingdom that cannot be shaken, an everlasting one. So another side of God's rest is found in the eternal city and destiny of God's people. All of this to say that God's rest is a place, but also a state of being. It is a place, but it is also a state of being. It is, it is future, but we can enter it right now. It is as if the heavenly throne room is trying to reach down into our current experience, our everyday lives, and completely alter here and now. So it's, it's someday, one day, but it's also here today. Our Father in heaven speaks from his throne with the hope that his children will hear him and have his truth and promises bring us into rest. And so my hope is that you are listening this morning, that you are listening. The rest of God brings us away from a slave-like relationship with God and into one that responds to his grace. It brings us past dead religion and into full life and joy with him. It brings us away from fear and worries and into a trust which is free in his love. It takes us past self-effort and self-righteousness into running into the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to enter into God's rest. But, but let's look at God's word. Let's look at our passage for today. The author of Hebrews writes, Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. This, this rest that he speaks of is, is out there. It's real. It's available to all who will believe. And here we are told to be aware that none of you be found to have fallen short. The New Living Translation says it this way. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. The writer of Hebrews warns of a failure to enter God's rest. He does not want us to miss out 
on God's rest. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way. You see, Christ saves his people eschatologically. Huh? Sekhoa. Eschatologically. That's how he saves his people, which simply means he seals us for a future glory. But he also wants to save you for a glorious today. So don't fall short of this rest. For we also have received the good news just as they did. But the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed enter the rest in keeping with what he has said. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. What the writer of Hebrews does here is he takes us back to the generation that was kept out of the promised land. They were the Exodus generation, delivered from Egypt by plagues and miracles, brought to the Red Sea, and then to the border of the promised land by the power of God. Before taking occupation of this promised land, Moses sends out 12 spies to go survey the land. And so they go. They go and check it out. And then they come back with a report. And and if you know the story, two of them go, you know what? We can take the land. Ten go, I don't think this is a good idea. The multitude believed the ten. And they were therefore not united with those who heard it in faith, a.k.a. Joshua and Caleb. So that generation did not enter God's rest. Here we learn how to access God's rest. That's that's what we're being told here. This is what the writer of Hebrews is doing. He's he's trying to show us how to access God's rest. It, It doesn't begin with work or effort. Think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. It doesn't begin with work or effort. What, what, what did the Israelites do? Let, 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 let me take us back, right? Let me, let me take us back. Um, because I think for, for many of us, we, we read the Bible like it's just a, a collection of stories. But hear me, these are real events. These things happened. These are real people. And so I want to slow things down a little bit for us because I think we read too quickly. And so here, here, here we find in the book of Exodus, the, the Israelites in Egypt, 400 years of slavery. And then Moses shows up, meets with Pharaoh, and he says, Pharaoh, God says you need to let his people go. Pharaoh goes, no way. Plague after plague after plague after plague. Still Pharaoh says, no, he hardens his heart. The final one. Firstborn sons die. This now impacts directly Pharaoh. And so he goes, you know what? I can't take this anymore. Moses, take your people and go. And so Moses calls the Israelites and says, all right, here's the plan. We're going to go. Imagine now, he says, six o'clock, right? Six a.m., we're going to go. We're meeting at this location and we're going to go. Now, now, can, can... Friends, can can I be human with you for a moment? Can we be human with one another? Can can we? Can can we be real for a moment? Let's let's just be human. Because I think, you know, this pretending and performing that we do is of no good. I believe among the Israelites, there were various kinds of faith. And what I mean about that is, is that is that if Moses said, We'll be here at 6. I'm pretty sure there were folks who were there at 5 a.m. They were ready to go. They had heard the promises. Generation after generation after generation of what it is that God would do. And they go, you know what? Today is the day. Moses said, ah, my family, we're going to be there 5 a.m. They believe. I also believe that among the Israelites, there were those who rolled up at about 6.05, 6.10. <laughs> right? They believe. 
but it just, it, it took a while to get the kids ready, to pack everything, like it just, you know what I mean? I understand, I understand. Some of you here are the 605, 610 kind of people. <laughs> you believe, but Moses said six. But it's okay. God is gracious. He's patient. And then I also believe there are those who were, they packed their bags, but they kept looking out the window to see who would go. I believe, but I'm going to wait and see who's going to go. Right? Like, like oh, th- there's the Mokhatles. Yeah, but they're full time in this thing. <laughs> they have to go. Uh, the the Tad hopes. Yeah, but you know, Jono sings. Christy's with the kids. Ah, uh, you know, they gotta go. Hey, Tia, Tiamo's going. Tia, Tia, no, I'm, I'm only, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Tiamo's there. He's a six, six oh five, six oh five group. But, but there are those. There's, there's, there's some faith. But you're like, I just want to see. I want to see if there'll be a, a big group of people who'll show up. Let's be honest. Which one are you? Which one are you when God says? But anyway, they start their journey. They're walking. And I'm sure they're going, what on earth is going on? How come Pharaoh's doing nothing? Look at God. And so they make their journey. They walk and they walk and they walk and they walk. And then they get to the Red Sea. Again, I think sometimes we, we read too quickly and, 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 and just let's slow down. Let's be human for a moment. It's not like they took a turn and then it's like, ah, the Red Sea. They saw this thing for kilometers, like kilometers away. They were like, Moses, where, where, where are we going? Where are we going? God said, here's where you need to go, regardless of what is in front of you. And, and so they, they just, they, they, get the, they are front of the row faith, who just like, yeah, I'm, I see it, I'm going, I see it. God said. There's middle of the pack. It's like, okay. And, and then there's those at the back. They want to turn, but they know that God can get, sometimes get a little salty with those who turn back. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So they don't, but they, but you know what I mean? They just... We, we, we're at different places. But we keep going. Yeah. Then they get to the Red Sea and they camp there for a little bit, trying to figure out what, what we're going to do. And, and I'm sure they're going, Moses, Moses, what's, like, what's going on? Why are we here? Why are we stop? Like, what's the, what's the plan? Are there boats coming? Did you spend 40 years with Jethro building boats and they're going to come? Like, what's the plan? What, most, I, God said, I, mean, I don't know. God said, this is where we need to go. Then people begin to talk. The people in the front can hear the people at the back beginning to talk. And it's not just normal talk. It's, it's, it's anxious talk. It's worried talk. It's, it's fearful talk. Why? Because they can begin to see Pharaoh coming with his soldiers. See, Pharaoh's changed his mind. He realized that I can't, it's like it's really hard to do this work by myself, right? I need slaves. But he's so filled with rage. He's just like, you know what? I don't want to bring them back. I'm going to go kill those people. And, and so he's on his way. And so now things, things are heating up a little bit. It's, it's going from, okay, we're just waiting to like, oh, all right, all right, Moses, what's the plan? And, and I'm sure there were folks who were like, who, who were going, you know what? Red Sea, Pharaoh, maybe if we just went this way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like if we just, if we just did, you know what I mean? Like we're going to get to the same place, but, but let's just, no, God didn't say this way. God said this way. So in faith, we wait. <sighs> Fast forward, we know the story ends. The Lord parts the Red Sea. They walk on dry land. And, and as the, uh, the, the Egyptians are about to, enter into onto that dry land. God closes up the Red Sea. They die. They make it to the other side. They celebrate. 
Exodus 15, I mean, they, like, they write a song. They, and, and, and that is how we respond to God's, like we sing our faces off. I don't get it when some of us are just like, yeah, I really believe God is powerful. Oh, he's so amazing. Like, I, it makes no sense to me. No sense. But they sing their faces off because they're celebrating. They cannot believe what God has done. And so it's a party. And they're eating and they're drinking because they brought their stuff. They had a, you know, a little scuff teen and it's great. And, uh, but then after some time, the food runs out. The drink runs out. Moses. I just want to let you know, if you're going to enter into leadership, that's, that's what you're going to experience. All right? <laughs> just a good friend of mine, Joby Martin, says uh, uh, leadership is like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, there's always some people going, it's too much. Some people going, it's not enough. And then some people saying, you know, it's just right. You know, it's just right. And I, I, I praise Jesus for the just right people. Um, so, so Moses, what do we, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I mean, some of them begin to like, man, it was way better back in Egypt. You know, like, can you remember when it was like, like, are you, are you serious? You, you know why? You know why some people say that? We are, we are more comfortable with a, a dysfunctional known than an unknown freedom. Let me, let me say that again. So, some of us, we are, we are comfortable with a dysfunctional known than an unknown freedom. I don't, I don't know. What I do know is God is taking us to a place of freedom. He's liberating us. There's no ways back there was ever better. Ever. And that's what, like Satan will do that. He'll, he'll, he'll make it look nice. He'll make it feel nice. But it's not free. So Moses. So God comes through and he says, okay, manna from heaven. And the quails and it's amazing. And they're, like they're eating this. And they're just like, wow, look at God. He's so incredible. Then, guys, like it's weird. It's like one of those stories where you're just like, does it not, like why couldn't you just boom? Like Egypt, boom, promised land. That's, that's not how God works, right? The Amalekites show up. The Amalekites, these, these guys, were, they, they're like raiders. They're like, you know what I mean? They're just a rough crowd of people. They, they hear that Pharaoh has let the Israelites go. They're like, what? All that free labor? Nah, let's go. Let's go get them. And, and, and let's be honest, that's a legitimate plan because 400 years of slavery, these people know nothing about warfare. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. And so the Amalekites show up. Exodus 17, they, then Moses says to Joshua, listen, you should go. Go to the front. Grab a group of men. I'm sure they're going, what are we going to do? I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Moses goes up to the mountain and he puts his hands up in the air praise and when his hands were in the air were told that the Israelites would win and every time he would lower his hands they would lose now you can imagine putting your hands up for an extended period of time it gets tiring so what then happens Aaron and her come on either side and they help him up what, what's it telling us friends we were beautifully designed for community in times of trouble, sometimes we just need to raise our hands and let Jesus fight the battle for us. And when I get tired, when I get weary, when I'm like, I don't know, like it feels like nothing's happening, community, community, would you help me? And so, so they defeat the Amalekites. Let's fast forward now. They get to the border of the promised land. They're right there. Moses sends the spies. Report comes back, and all 10 of them give the same report-ish. They go, we saw the land. It was good. It was spacious. Flowing with milk and honey. I mean, we even brought some, some, some of the, the grapes, the fruit, the ripe. Like, look how big they are. Guys, it's beautiful. And everyone cheers. Yay! And then the 10 go, but hold on, hold on, hold on. We also saw some of the ites. Right? The ites, the other tribes. We, 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 like they're there. And so I don't know. I don't know if we should do this. Because in that moment, I hope that all of us would have the same spirit that Caleb had. Go read Exodus 13, verse 30. His response, he's like, no, no, he quietens them. He says, hey, 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 stop. We are able. 
in those three words, we are able. And what he's saying is that, no, no, not us, but God. Because we saw the same God lead us out of Egypt. We saw the same God part the Red Sea. We saw the same God manna from heaven. We saw the same God defeat the Amalekites. We are able. In every community, there is the ten and there is the two. Even in this community, there is the ten and there is the two. My hope is that the voices of the two would always be louder than the voices of the ten. We are able. I have no idea what's in front of you. We are able. Not because of us, but because of him. It's when we look at Christ and not our circumstances that we're able to continue. It doesn't begin with work or effort. They simply put their faith in him. They simply put their faith in him. It's, it's step by step. It's just going, okay, let's just keep going. It's putting one foot in front of the other. That's what it is. Simply trusting him. See, when thinking of faith here, it's important to remember the comparison the writer of Hebrew uses. He points to the Exodus generation. They were so close, but their lack of faith was displayed by the, what Stephen spoke about so beautifully last week, their partial obedience. You want to know how dangerous partial obedience is? Take a look. They didn't enter into the promised land, but rather wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And then that generation didn't even make it. It was a whole new generation that made it in. Friends, the reason we must remember their story is that today we have the opportunity to enter into God's rest. But inaction, which is fueled by unbelief, will keep us from this rest. James says, faith without works is dead. It's easy to have a faith when you're sitting here on the chair. And nothing is happening. I believe. But it's like, okay, let's go. Yeah, but what's in front of me is, you know. And, and you know the 10? Like, like they, 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 they told the truth in what they saw, but then they exaggerated. Yo, they were giants. They were like yeah. And you know what? It, like when you exaggerate, you know what that is? It's, 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 like, it's like a white lie. It's still a lie. But that's what fear does. Fear is not an emotion, it's a spirit. And we have not been given a spirit of fear. One step in front of the other. That's what faith is. I'm not sure. I don't, know. I don't have all the answers. But what I do know is that God loves us and God is powerful. We might not know what God asks or what he has in store for us on the other side, but we do know that it's good. Faith is how it works. You want to enter into his rest. Faith is how it works, a living faith. Do we trust God and believe his word for our lives? When worried, will we cast our anxiety on him because he cares for us? When fruitless, will we meditate and delight on the word of God until the situation changes? When joyless, will we abide in Christ so that his transformation can occur? Time and time again, we're confronted with the word of God about his desire for our lives. We enter into his desires, his abundance, his rest for us. How? By faith. But then the writer of Hebrews says this, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world, for some way he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Again, in that passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. See, the writer of Hebrews then shifts our attention to remembering something else. First, he starts with the Exodus generation, but then he shifts our attention, uh, taking us further back the biblical timeline. He now goes to the very beginning. To Genesis, he directs us to the seventh day of creation, which was not a creation day, if you think about it. It was a rest day. Quoting Genesis 2, verse 2, he wrote, he wrote, and on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. The author of Hebrews is telling us that this rest he has been writing about is not a recent invention. We can go all the way back to Genesis. 
It's not an idea that we came up with. No, this rest was instituted by God and has been available throughout the whole of humanity's history. And it is acquired by faith. See, I believe the writer of Hebrews takes us back to creation because he wants to make a cosmic point. You see, back in Genesis 1 and 2, things were good. They were more than good. They were great. In that state of perfection, Adam and Eve enjoyed and experienced God in such a beautiful way. Access was real for them. They could walk with God in the coolness of the day. Relationship and friendship and ownership flowed. Then things went horribly wrong. Adam and Eve sinned, and this ushered in brokenness and turmoil. And we now we're separated from God and his blessings. But then Jesus came lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that all of us deserved, rose from the grave, conquering sin, death, and Satan, and established for us a relationship with God the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we celebrate Christ's blood. Christ's blood shed for us by his sacrifice, and we do this in faith. Jesus made a way for us to get back to the Father, to fellowship with him. We aren't held back from God by our sin any longer. For the perfect son substituted himself for us, and now we are partakers of his righteousness before the Father. See, God sees us now in a way he sees his son. The position we possess before God, friends, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing because what it does is, in a sense, it takes us back to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2. The rest of God that is being offered to us restores, restores our relationship with God the Father. It enables us to be able to be in his presence, to, to seek his grace. All of this by the blood of Jesus. And so the writer of Hebrews takes us all the way back and says, you, you remember that day? Remember how good it was? How sweet it was? You can have that today by entering into his rest through Jesus. Verse 6, therefore, since it remains for some to enter, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter because of disobedience. He again specifies a certain day, today. He specified the speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today. Today. Unlike the original Exodus generation who, when they disobeyed through unbelief, were kept out of the promised land for 40 years. For them, the rest of God was in the future for future generations. But for us, for us, the rest of God is accessible today. It's accessible today. Today, afresh, we can get back to the throne and the promises and the joy that is found in God. Today, we get a daily invitation to be with God, to sit with him, to learn from him, to be guided by him, to be cared by him, to be loved by him. Today. Today. So friends, let's stop with the excuses. Let's stop with this partial disobedience. L let me say gently, let's get over ourselves. Let's just get over ourselves. You, you're not that big of a... In relation to this, you need God's rest. You just do. The world needs God's rest. We see it. So what would it look like for you today? Today. For you to enter God's rest. What would change in your life today? Today. To enter God's rest. Verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. See, God's rest is now seen in the promised land victory of Joshua. Now we, we fast forward. We go back again to the Exodus generation. But then we go forward to, to Joshua now leading God's people into the promised land. And, and it's at that moment you think, yes, now they have the fullness of the rest. See, Joshua eventually took the people into the land of Canaan. Victories mounted. And soon they had general rest. There was still land to conquer, but they were successful. Future victories were promised but Psalm 95, which is where the writer of Hebrews quotes a lot of what we see in Hebrews 4, it speaks of a future rest. Joshua had not fulfilled God's promised rest. 
Though victorious, they still had battles and wars in the promised land. Little side note here. This one's for free. The mention of Joshua should remind us of the name of Jesus. It's the same name. The second Joshua, Jesus, finished what the first Joshua left unfinished. I I, I hope you see, that's why the writer of Hebrews mentions him. And it reveals to us as we make our way through the book of Hebrews that Jesus is greater, we saw this a couple weeks ago, he's greater than Moses, but he's also greater than Joshua. And so even the generation that was like, yo, Josh, Jesus is better. Because yes, Joshua led us to the promised land, and yes, we got to experience it, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that rest that God wanted for us. No, that had to be completed by Jesus. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. Verse 10, for the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. See, every week the people of Israel would practice a 24-hour rest before the Lord, a time to stop from work and celebrate God. This was brought into play by Moses in the Ten Commandments. But Genesis 2, 2 tells us that a point came where the creation was complete, right? Like we see that in Genesis 2. And then we're told that God rested from his work. He made the seventh day holy. Here the the Hebrew says, for the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did. Now, I I believe here the the, the writer of Hebrews is, is doing two things. He's going, listen, there is a Sabbath day, a day that you must take to rest to rest from your work, you must. It's not an option, it's not a suggestion, it's like, no, 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 take, take time to rest, to be with God and to celebrate with Him. But, but also what he's doing is that he, he's, he's pointing us to the fact that there is no longer any place for works as a basis of our own righteousness. That's done, that's done, for we receive it by faith. There is a sense in which to enter Christian salvation means to seize from one's works. There's no amount of work that you can do to enter into salvation. God rested from his works on the original Sabbath of Genesis 2-2 because the work was finished. We stop from self-justifying works because Jesus finished the work on the cross. I'm going to call the band up here real quick as I land this plane. Friends, the the Sabbath is a gift from God. The Sabbath is a gift from God that helps us to experience life more fully by setting apart time to reflect on God as the center of our lives. The Sabbath should never be a burden. God is the one who provides for us. He is the one who heals and restores us. He's the one who saves us from our sin and invites us to share in his rest by placing our faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the whole point here, is will you enter this rest? Firstly, by surrendering your life to him. Stop all this work of trying to gain favor with God through all these things. No, no, no. I say this often. It is easy to become a Christian. To become one, super simple. All you have to do is say, God, I need a favor. I cannot save myself. I want to enter into your rest. Save me. That's it. That's all you do. It's the one prayer request that I know God answers 100% of the time. But I also say that being a Christian... Now, that's hard. That's hard. Keeping the Sabbath, honoring the Sabbath, that's hard. That requires intentionality. That requires discipline. But you are missing out on so much if you don't. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. You are missing out on so much if you don't. Verse 11 says, let us then make every effort, every effort, every effort 
to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. See, when we rest in God, we deepen our relationship with Him. We increase our dependence on God for both His material and spiritual provision. Glorifying God should be the central aspect of both our work and our rest. God promises that if we turn to Him for rest, He will restore our souls. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to respond in song. But if you're if you're carrying some stuff, if you're weary, if you're exhausted, if you find yourself constantly trying to turn rocks to bread, trying to make a plan, trying to hustle, and you know this is beyond work, the work that God calls me to do. No, 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 it's beyond that. Like, like I'm trying to be in control of my life. Then I'm gonna ask that you come and just lay it down. Just lay it down. Whether it's where you're seated right now, but but my hope is that that you would say, God, I I want a living faith. I want an active faith. I want a faith that takes one step and another step and another step. There's nothing magical about this prayer corner. There's nothing magical about being up front and asking someone to pray. No, no, there there isn't. But you know what it does? It communicates something. I believe, I believe. The Red Sea in front of me, Pharaoh behind, I believe. I believe that where God is leading me is to a place of rest. Because he is there. And so come and lay it down. Please, please lay it down. Today, today, the right of Hebrew says. Come and lay it down. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just, I'm going to read out a couple of scriptures. I'm going to read them over you. As a reminder of how much God loves us. My hope is that these words, they they would take a hold of your heart and they would activate something in you. If it's for the first time that you are entering into his rest, then just say to him, God, I need a favor. And and it's so hard in our context. Let me be real. It's so hard to, to, to realize that actually I'm not a Christian because we've grown up in church and we've gone to the Bible studies and we've gone to the home groups and we've gone to the family groups and and, and so we just kind of go, you know, this, uh, yeah, I think I'm a Christian. But have you made that decision for yourself? Today is an opportunity for you to enter into his rest. But for the rest of you who've been walking with Jesus for a while, hear these words. And then come and lay it down. Let's get over ourselves. Let's put one foot in front of the other. And let's just say, God, we're going to trust in you. We are able. Exodus 33 verse 14, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Psalm 4 verse 8, in peace I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Psalm 23 verse 1 to 2, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. Psalm 73 verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 127, 1 to 2, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall feel exhausted, but they will wait for the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Jeremiah 31, 25, for I will satisfy the weary soul and every languishing soul I will replenish. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. 
In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And so, Father God, I pray for us. I pray for us as a community that we would be a people who enter into your rest, who trust you, who take just one step after the other saying yes to you in obedience to what you have called us to. There are so many miracles here, Lord. They're just waiting. They're waiting on the other side of our step of obedience. And so, God, I pray for those who are weary. Would you give them rest? Father, let us lay it all down. Let us lay it all down. I pray for those who are hurting, who've gone through pain, who've gone through loss, who are looking to the heavens and asking God, where are you? I pray that you would meet them where they are. I pray for those who, who are going, get, uh, like the Father in, in, in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, they're going, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. God, I'm so thankful that you're not afraid of doubt. But rather, you say, bring our doubts to you. Would you increase our strength? All of us are in desperate need of a Savior. His name is Jesus. And so we're going to lay it down before you, Jesus. At your feet. We are loved more than we could ever imagine. It's in your beautiful name we pray.